Hey everyone, I'm Evan Solomon, the publisher of G Zero Media. This is a special G Zero podcast edition of the top risks of 2024. That, of course, comes from our parent company, Eurasia Group. Now, I'm sitting in for Ian Bremmer. You might expect his voice on the podcast today, but Ian is one of our featured guests today, and he's one of the key authors of the annual forecast of the urgent risks of 2024. So hang in there. He's coming. Now, we've got raging conflicts in Ukraine, raging conflicts in the Middle East. We've got emerging largely unregulated AI technologies, and we're going to dig into that. And of course, you've got the 2024 US election. So if you think of the risks ahead, there's a lot to discuss. So today on the pod, we've got an all-star lineup of experts. They're all standing by to help us understand what these risks mean and how they're going to impact you in the coming year. All right, there's the setup. Let's get at it. This G Zero podcast is brought to you by Bleecker Street and LD Entertainment. Presenting ISS. When war breaks out on Earth between the US and Russia, astronauts aboard the International Space Station fight each other for control. This sci-fi thriller is only in theaters January 19th. Let's begin with the masterminds behind this report. Of course, Ian Bremmer, the president of Eurasia Group and G Zero Media. And Cliff Cupshin is Eurasia Group's chairman. First of all, you know, great to see both of you. And I'm sorry that the year is obviously lining up to be so nasty. Yeah, let's start with you because this report begins and you call 2024 in the risk report, the Voldemort of years. It's going to be nasty. It's only January 8th. What are the factors that make 2024 so much worse than 2023? Well, it's not all the elections. You know, we've heard a lot of this talk that, you know, you got billions of people going to the polls and so much uncertainty and stability. Mo most of the elections happening around the world are actually stabilizing. They're fine. Mexico, India, Indonesia, Turkey, the European Union, even some bad ones like Bangladesh and Russia. It's not like anything is going to change or surprise anybody. No, the problem is the United States. Uh, it is the most powerful country in the world. Um, it is a democracy. And unlike its economy, unlike its national security space, its democracy is in crisis. The U.S. is unique among advanced industrial democracies in not necessarily being able to pull off a free and fair, peaceful transition of power. It's become delegitimized. Its institutions are getting weaker. And that is that is the issue, uh, and, and especially that it's happening at a time when you have some major wars that are happening in the world, it's not a peaceful backdrop or environment. So if the United States says, OK, not it, we can't do any leadership, we're too busy fighting ourselves, well, the rest of the world can just hold on and take a breath for a while. No, no, it's happening in the context of a global environment that is very deeply dangerous to some existentially so. Uh, and so adver adversaries will take advantage. Allies will feel uh, extremely uncertain uh, and, and will need to hedge. Um, and the United States itself will be tearing itself apart, will be fighting uh, internally. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, these days, whether you're a Biden or a Trump supporter, you view the, the opponents as your principal adversaries. You don't share basic facts. You don't share basic sense of where, where your country is going and, and who your fellow countrymen are. So uh, that, that's the, the main reason uh, why we think 2024 is so unprecedentedly dangerous, at least, at least from our lifetime's perspectives. Yeah, not, not your adversary, or maybe even your enemy, even worse. Okay, we're going to dig into that in just a minute. we got great guests lined up, Ian, but Cliff, let me just bring you in, because last year last year was kind of a yin-yang year for the report, right? You had optimism, uh, and then you had the pandemic was ending, and that was good, but there was a cautionary tale, remember? The tech grows amassing power. Is there a central theme this year that you can talk about before we get to the list? The central theme is, is the three wars. Russia, Ukraine, ugly, getting worse. Israel, Hamas, still escalating. And our top risk, the U.S. versus itself, which Ian began to talk about. Highly polarizing election in a dysfunctional democracy. None of the conflicts have ad adequate guardrails. None of the conflicts have leaders that know how to fix them. And most problematically, the sides don't even know what they're talking about. They each have different exceptions of what, what the issues are. That's the thing. All right, central theme conflict. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to reveal the whole list, 
We're going to explore some of the key risks in depth with our special guests who are waiting. But I want to do a quick lightning round and, and, and just kind of give people a sense of what the list. So let me go through the top five because some folks won't understand the titles. And real quick at number 10. So here's our top risks from Eurasia Group Revealed. Number 10, risky business. Not the Tom Cruise movie. This is about U.S. culture wars in corporate boardrooms. Then we go to number nine. I'll give you a minute to take these in. Number nine is El Nino. It's back. Now, why is that a risk? You hang on. We'll tell, let you know. Number eight, no room for error. This is about the precarious global economy and inflation. Maybe a, still a big worry, obviously. And finally, number seven, then we'll stop here and get Ian and Cliff back, the fight for critical minerals. So you've got that risky business, Ian, El Nino, no room for error, and the fight for uh, critical minerals as, you know, 10 to 7. But a lot of those things, Ian, a lot of those folks, people might think, wait, why are these risks? They're opportunities. Critical minerals is an opportunity. Um, you know, corporate boardrooms, you know, corporations are more free to do what they want. What are the risks here? Um, the, the risks are that they are increasingly prevented by politics from making the decisions they would like to make. Uh, El Nino uh, is uh, the lack of engaging on climate for decades, now causing costs that are disrupting supply chains, leading to more forced migration, uh, creating more instability. Uh, critical minerals, it's absolutely critical, it's essential that we are spending trillions of dollars in transforming a global economy from fossil fuels uh, to a post-carbon energy environment, but we're doing it at a time that countries are fighting over those critical minerals for their own domestic purposes. They're creating industrial policies, they're creating export controls, they're using this as a stick for their own national security and political purposes, which undermine the functioning of a free and fair, well-regulated and transparent market. So, I mean, I think consistently when you talk about political risk, you're talking about places where political scientists are causing trouble for you. Right? On a normal day, you don't need the political scientists. You don't want them, right? You'd much rather have an environment where the boardroom can talk to the people that know the business. Talk about your economic risks and your cycles. Are you in a recessionary cycle? You're an expansion cycle. You know, what do you think? When the political scientists start coming in and the risks, risks impact you, that usually means that there's going to be greater cost, greater needs to hedge, greater needs to change the behaviors you otherwise would be prioritizing as a leader. And it's kind of interesting that that uh, cliff, no room for error, just what Ian's talking about. That's one of the top risks. Why is that the risk? Because when you have higher for longer, when you have sticky inflation and sticky high interest rates, governments don't have room to, to do expansive fiscal policies like you normally do in a crisis. Government's got to get it right or they're going to be highly indebted and have a big drag on growth. So there is no room for error. Okay, L let me get from the six now all the way up to one, because now this really describes what both of you are talking about. You've got number six, no China recovery. We talked about China last year and the consolidation of Maximum Xi, but there's a different risk about their slowing economy. Then you've got number five, axis of rogues. And we talked about this, a play on obviously axis of evil, if you remember that phrase, but the axis of rogues, and you know, you know, look at the figures there from North Korea, Iran, and, and Russia there. We'll dig into that. Number four, ungoverned AI. Ian has unique insight into this. He's got the pen uh, on the UN panel for governance of AI. So he's got a very deep insight on that. And we'll talk about why that's a risk. Number three, I think maybe the most fascinating and the one that no one's talked about and, and partitioned Ukraine, kind of the unnamed thing that people don't want to admit, but that's risk three, a partitioned Ukraine. We'll dig into that. Number two, the Middle East on the brink, and Ian and Cliff alluded to this um, and, the, and the risks of a widening war there. And the big one, Ian, and I'll start with you, and then Cliff, as you get, you wrap these up into what Cliff called this theme of conflict, which is the United States versus itself. As if the United States, not just a regional wars in the Middle East, but it's like the United States is at war with itself. So before we dig into these individually, um, look at this. Why were these the top risks of the year specifically, Ian? 
Yeah. I mean, when you look at the top three, and again, what we're measuring is impact, likelihood, and imminence for the year of 2024. We have these three major wars, um, Middle East, which is set to escalate significantly, and we'll be talking with Zaid Rod about that shortly. We have Russia, Ukraine, which is changing trajectory of a war and leading to a partition of Ukraine, which no one wants other than the Russians, but is going to be the outcome. Um, and it's not stabilizing, certainly not for the Ukrainians or the Europeans. Um, and then you have the United States, uh, which is an unprecedented uh, and dysfunctional fight uh, between American citizens themselves at a time that the rest of the world can scant afford it. Um, and, and in all three of these wars, the belligerents have neither the willingness nor the capacity to bring the conflict to an end. There, there is no diplomacy that's occurring in either, in any of these three wars mm. that make it likely that you will reduce these tensions or you will contain the conflict. We don't have guardrails between Trump and Biden and his support and their supporters between the Israelis and the Palestinians and more broadly in the Middle East, or between the Russians and the Ukrainians, nor do we share the same information space, the same narrative space. We don't even, these groups don't even agree on the same basic facts. So, you know, we're, we're facing 2024, not only with these three major fights that will impact people and the economy all over the world, but also without a capacity to contain them. Um, and that is, that's pretty disturbing when you look ahead at what we expect for the coming year. I want to dig into this because just the fact that we're categorizing war in the Middle East, partitioned Ukraine in and of itself, we got to dig into that. And then the U.S. election in the same kind of grouping of conflict is fascinating. So let's uh, dig into that. Now, remember, folks, if you're watching now or you're just tuning in, we're talking about Eurasia Group's top risks of 2024 to download the report and check it out for yourself, which you should do. It's unbelievably well written. Head to eurasiagroup.net slash top risks. So check that out and spend some time on it. It's really interesting. Um, let's dig in, though, and bring in our first special guest to join Cliff and Ian, who will stay with us for the hour. Now, a lot of these risks are connected, as we just talked about, conflicts, the Middle East, Ukraine, the axis of rogues, the U.S. election. So we're calling that kind of conflicts of 2024. And let me bring in Zaid Rad Al Hussein. He's the CEO and president of the International Peace Institute and former U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights. Zaid, welcome. I, I would say Happy New Year, but after that opening from Ian and Cliff, uh, it would sound terrible to say happy. Just I'll just say welcome to the new year. Let's start with the Israel-Hamas war um, that obviously the deadly attacks uh, kicked off on October 7th. What, in your view, is the biggest risk for that conflict in the year ahead? Well, if it continues uh, apace, I mean, we've seen the ferocity that was meted out by Hamas and in the most brutal way on the 7th of October met with an equally ferocious Israeli response with interest because the casualties on the part of the Palestinians are horrendous in, in Gaza. And of course, the response, and this is rippled throughout the world. I mean, the world is reacting to it. Uh, the danger is, as Ian is saying, that with the absence of any real plan, uh, the defense minister in Israel released a, a plan which was quickly ridiculed, uh, not just in Israel, but uh, elsewhere, because it didn't go beyond just stabilizing the situation in Gaza. And without looking further afield at the Israeli-Palestinian relationship and the return to negotiation on the basis of two states, uh, there is no nothing then to prevent this from, from expanding further, as Ian was saying. And it also it leads to the potential of the West Bank uh, becoming a region that is completely uh, beyond our control. We've seen only, only one day ago Israeli uh, aerial attacks on Janine, the first time in two decades. And uh, and if this continues, by the time we get to the 22nd of March, and I urge uh, the, the viewers to pay attention to that particular date, um, because there we may see a real explosion in early in the early spring if, if we don't somehow arrest the developments uh, in Gaza. Okay, just before I get uh, Ian and Clifton jump in, Zay, just real quick, because you're a diplomat from the region, namely Jordan, obviously. Obviously, radicalization on all sides here has been uh, one of the dramatic consequences. Has this destroyed 
or made almost remote the idea or the possibility of a two-state solution, or is there any optimism there? No. Well, first of all, I'm, I used to be a diplomat and no longer a diplomat. No, there's a great deal of viscosity. I mean, people, when the people are frightened, they will retreat into their sort of tribal so uh, tribal camps, and this is what's happening both in the Arab world and in, inside of Israel. But there is viscosity. I mean, if you present them with hope and you present them with a plan that can be sort of uh, orchestrated and put together and can establish a lasting peace, one where Israelis feel secure and Palestinians feel secure and the Palestinians can celebrate the end of occupation and, and uh, their statehood, then we we will have a permanent peace in the Middle East. And that's ultimately the greatest security we can assure all peoples there. And, and that's what we should be striving for. Uh, Ian, I want to just jump in on what Zay was talking about, the widening war and the fears of, the, of this thing widening. We just witnessed a terrorist attack in Iran that left dozens dead. Uh, the Islamic State claimed responsibility. You got the Houthis involved in targeting cargo ships in the Red Sea, very disruptive to the global economy. You've got the tax, of course, in southern Lebanon now. Um, what factors are you looking at? What are the biggest risk factors in terms of this just expanding and dragging people in? Well, I wish there were just one. Uh, the, the problem is that there are so many vectors where this war can easily escalate. Uh, as Zaid talked about the tribalism, so many more tens of millions of people will be radicalized around the world on the basis of the war that we've already experienced over the last three months. I mean, in Indonesia, you had 1.4 million people marching uh, in favor of the Palestinians against uh, the Israelis. It got almost no attention in the United States and Europe, but it's the largest Muslim co country in the world. Uh, that, that matters. Uh, long term in terms of a very, very small number of them being willing to actively commit violence against Americans, against Jews, against interests in the West, for example. So you're going there are going to be avenues in terms of lone wolves and more organized terrorism in the in Europe, in the United States, uh, across the Middle East. There are avenues in terms of what the Houthis are continuing to do, despite the United States leading a multilateral uh, military engagement to try to ensure peaceful transit of the waterways in the Gulf, you're continuing to see that fight. That could easily lead to the Americans targeting the Houthis in Yemeni bases themselves. That would explode. Uh, Zaid already talked about how this could go to the West Bank, how this could go to Hezbollah in Lebanon. None of these actors want metastasized regional war. But as Trotsky says, sometimes war wants you. Um, and, and that increasingly in the Middle East is what we're looking at. The inability of the United States, frankly, as a marginal player in these outcomes to be able to ensure deterrence and stability in the region. The Americans do not have that interest. Uh, excuse me. The Americans do not have that interest, do not have that capacity. Israel uh, has some of that capacity, but increasingly the war cabinet and particularly Prime Minister Netanyahu does not have the interest because he's likely uh, to leave office very shortly when the war is over and maybe go to jail. And certainly Hamas and other institutions that do not recognize the right of Israel to exist in the region does not have uh, the interest uh, or that capacity. So, I mean, you know, set against all of that, I think the question is which of these avenues are most likely to explode and to what degree uh, over the course of the coming months? It's very hard to, uh, it's much harder to imagine threading a needle that allows you to contain the present war to Israel and Gaza than it is to say, how do we stop it from expanding across the region? Much harder to do the former. You are listening to our G0 presentation of Eurasia Group's top risks of 2024. We're talking about the conflicts, which is one of the big themes. I'm here with, of course, Ian Bremer. And our special guest, Zaid Rad Al Hussein, the president of the International Peace Institute, and Cliff Kupchin, our chairman. And uh, Cliff, I, I want to bring you into the conversation because obviously as a Russia expert and Russia plays a role here, not only in the conflict in Ukraine and one of the top risks, which is partitioned Ukraine, but also on the axis of rogues, their relationship to Iran, their relationship to South Korea, uh, North Korea. Um, Let's just focus in on, on Russia's role there. First, in Ukraine, is this a victory for them in 2024 with a partition and and the risks, I guess, to Zelensky? And then what role are they playing in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis Iran? It is good. It's a much better outcome 
by 100 times than Russia could have expected a year ago, when it looked like they were going to get routed by the Ukrainians. In fact, they did for a brief while. The Russian army recovered. The Ukrainian army is having trouble recruiting people. They're having trouble producing weapons, having trouble forming strategy. So it looks like Russia, my guess, will they'll, they'll, they'll gain a little bit of land this year. Is it a victory? It's hard to call it a victory when you're under sanctions, when NATO's expanded, will expand, when the Ukrainians probably won't be neutral. They'll probably be affiliated with NATO, get into NATO over, over the medium term. So it, it's, a, it's a good outcome for Russia. It's a very, very, very hard to call it a victory. Look, I, mean, I think the big picture on Russia is that they are the, by far the world's most, well, they're the world's most revisionist state that could do something about undermining the international order. And they really want to do it. And I spent a lot of time around Putin. He really doesn't like the West. He really doesn't like the international system. He really wants to bring it down. The Iranians say the same stuff, but they can't do that much. So I think what Putin's doing in the Middle East is much more tightly in the axis of roads. We write about it. Much more tightly aligning himself with Iran, giving Iran you know, significantly more uh, potential and conventional arms, support for its rogue, for its proxies, and strengthening Iran's hands. So I think Russia is the, really the action we've got to watch out for in 2024, as far as bad, bad stuff goes. Okay, so let me bring in Zaid on that. Yeah. If I appreciate that very much. Uh, Zaid, dig in then on Iran. Because, as, as Cliff rightly points out, their proxies, whether it's Hezbollah, whether it's the Houthis in Yemen, I mean, are playing a major, major role. What role, what are the risks from Iran in your view this year? Well, Iran is, is uh, basically skirmishing through its proxies with uh, the United States and Israel. Uh, it has strengthened its relationship, as we've just heard, with China and, and Russia. Um, I don't think it, it, it you know, calculates on the basis of irrational decision making. It calculates very rationally, but it can be pitched into something it, it cannot control. And if we see something in particular happen to, for instance, the holy sites, and we spoke about the West Bank, but if you have something happening in Jerusalem, the holy sites, neither Hassan Nasrallah nor the leadership in Tehran would be able to stop the, you know, the consequences of something like that. And so, so the risks are, uh, of course, very great in the absence of any determined uh, effort to end this. You, if you imagine the way a clock works, there is a potential energy stored up in the mainspring. And the release of that is regulated through what's called an escapement. The escapement, the international mechanism to prevent conflict, is so weak that the, the, <laughs> the wheel is slipping. And the dangers, I think, specified in this particular uh, report and what we uh, see happening in 2024 is the slippage will come at cost. And sometimes a cost that we won't be able to quickly sort out or resolve. And, and, and so Iran is in the middle wheel, so to speak, of all of this between the major powers and then the, the regional powers more tightly engaged. OK, last thing on the theme of conflict, Ian, I'm going to bring you back in. I, I mean, you didn't use this word in the report. I, I kind of think of this as the frenemies aspect. I, I love this element because people don't think about this. You write in the report, you and Cliff, quote, um, Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan will all continue to be major U.S. allies, but their leaders' pursuit of their national and occasionally personal interests will further entangle Washington in growing conflicts. In other words, some of our strongest allies in the U.S. are also the biggest risks. How is that playing out? I love the fact that you as a Canadian are like some of our strongest allies in the U.S. Wow. He's just like, yeah, some of our, you know, uh, okay, I'm Canadian, okay. but it's okay, I'll pay for that. like the United States. That's no, cool. It's cool. I don't mind. So anyway, um, I, I, they are uh, some of your best allies, Evan. Um, and uh, Taiwan, uh, Ukraine uh, and uh, and Israel. Uh, these are countries that the United States is strongly supporting, strongly connected to. Uh, you know, the fact is that they are presently led by, and in the case of Taiwan, potentially led by, given the outcome of elections in just a few days, January 13th, by people that the U.S. president will neither like nor trust um, and, and yet has to find a way to try to manage relations that are deeply destabilizing for the rest of the world. I mean, Zelensky is not getting the kind of support that he wants and demands, despite everything the United States and its allies have done, 
They're not going to be able to retake their territory. He's under immense pressure domestically, and he's likely to increasingly act with desperation towards the Russians as a consequence. That's dangerous. Uh, Netanyahu uh, is by far uh, you strongest ally is the United States in the world, but the U.S. in supporting Netanyahu and supporting Israel in this conflict and in what increasingly looks like a, an ethnic cleansing effort by the Netanyahu government towards the Palestinians in Gaza is making the U.S. more isolated on the global stage and Biden more vulnerable domestically vis-a-vis -vis his Democrats than the Russians were when they invaded Ukraine two years ago. And then you have Taiwan and if Lai wins, and Biden would be perfectly happy if Lai didn't win, by the way. And if the KMT came in mm -hmm. and just had more stability with cross-strait relations with Beijing. But right now, slight favorite is William Lai from the DPP. He comes in and says, I want more autonomy. And, and his vice president, who's much closer to the Republicans on the Hill than they are with Biden, says, I'm going to invite all of them to Taiwan, and I want to pull a Pelosi times 10, right, from when she showed up and suddenly caused all of this backlash economically uh, and militarily from the Chinese. Biden's going to have to deal with that. So it's a very unusual situation where literally three of the best friends of the United States on the global stage are principal drivers of risk for the Americans. And, and no, I, I don't think anyone's talked about that. I think it's very important. Yeah. And by the way, and not to dig myself out of trap, also for the Canadians, because and many of the European countries, those are the same allies. They pose risks to all of that. All like right, like we care about the Canadians, Evan. Come on. We do. Here we go. I, I have to defend the Canadians. By the way, there is a Canadian aspect to the report yes, for yes. my Canadian friends. So you can download that as well. All right. We've got to leave the, the theme of conflicts before Ian and I get into a conflict over Canada again. Uh, Zaydrad Al Hussein, first of all, really appreciate your time, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ian and Cliff are going to stick around. If you're just joining us, we are discussing the top geopolitical risks of 2024 with. Ian Brammer and Cliff Kupchin are uh, co-authors of the uh, report. G0's parent company, Eurasia Group, has just released its much-talked-about annual report. Not surprising, as we just talked about, the Middle East, Ukraine, and uh, other conflicts are at the center of it. At number four, though, this year, now we talked about this last year, but it's really emerged. Number four risk was un is ungoverned AI. Now, last year, we saw the explosive growth for generative AI. That was a year of chat GDP. This year brings enormous questions about where it's going. Can it be regulated? Is it a threat or an opportunity or both? The report says this, quote, the gaps in AI governance will become evident in 2024 as regulatory efforts falter, Tech companies remain largely unconstrained and far more powerful AI models and tools spread beyond the control of governments. Is AI out of control? Let's click off that discussion about risk number four with one of the world's top experts, Marichka Shake. She's an international policy fellow at Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and a former EU parliamentarian. You also can catch her on G0 every week. She does some great videos for us on AI. Mishka, first of all, great to have you on the program. Um, AI technology is evolving significantly faster than, than any governance efforts. What is the biggest risk in 2024? Well, the risks report and congratulations on all the heavy lifting that everybody's been doing. I think it's it's very insightful and urgent. Um, but the, the theme on AI is ungoverned AI. And I would say it is not ungoverned, but it's privately governed. And that is really an unprecedented situation. And so what I'll be looking out for in 2024 is whether public institutions, whether it's multilateral organizations or democratic states, are capable of not only keeping pace, but beginning to enforce the contours of regulation that they've laid out in 2023. Because frankly speaking, I share the worries. I think uh, the, the rapidly developing and unpredictable ways in which AI will impact our world are uh, absolutely risky and something to watch. But I have never seen a policy topic being tackled as quickly as AI has been tackled and as collaboratively. I mean, uh, across the world, whether we look at the G7, whether we look at the United Nations, whether we look at the US White House, the European Union, individual governments like the ones in, in Singapore, Canada, I mean, the list goes on and on. There are so many efforts to try to make sure that the public interest is protected, that safety and national security are safeguarded, and frankly, that democracy survives. And I know that we're going to talk about the impact of AI on elections, so I won't say too much uh, on that myself. 
But what I think the real dynamics are is whether this privatization of governance of AI is not already undermining democracy. So without the the impact of AI on election campaigns that the world is watching for, we can already see a sort of gradual erosion of um, accountability, of the protect, protection of the public interest, and the real growing power of these companies and technologies as such. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a dynamic to watch, but I'm actually... Uh, cautiously optimistic that governments get what's at stake and that they're acting. Okay, but but let me just stay with you quickly because you, you name check the Bletchley Park Declaration on AI safety, of course, in, in the EU, and you've got other ones. You, of course, uh, sit on the advisory board convened by the United Nations Secretary General alongside Ian. The goal is to help understand the risks and opportunities and, and, and to regulate it. But, I mean, I guess the world gets it, but but... Is AI just moving too fast to 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 make any of these efforts work? And what is the big what is kind of the headline risk? Will, will you make something that sounds good, but you know the horse is bolted from the barn? The horse is bolting from the barn, and I think that is a, a key risk and a challenge that governments are wrestling with. But I also think that in a combination of existing law that gets enforced in new contexts. I mean, we didn't need AI to understand that discrimination is illegal. We didn't need AI to know that antitrust rules matter in a fair economy. We didn't need AI to know that governments have a key responsibility to safeguard national security. And so those responsibilities have not changed. It's just that the, the way in which these core democratic principles are at stake has changed. And so it's not only about adopting new regulations, it's really also about enforcing existing principles and laws in new contexts. And so I think with the right political prioritization, and that is also something that we have to watch for. I mean, there's a whole host of very urgent issues on politicians' agenda. So let's just hope that agenda stay, stays um, focused on AI as well. Uh, but I think there there is a lot that governments can do. And I, I don't want people working in government to come away disempowered or to think that this technology is going to race on inevitably and that the race is already lost uh, by, by democratic or uh, global governance institutions. And at the UN, what we're trying to do, and I think that that remains critical also in 2024, is to make sure that this discussion is not Western-centric only, that this is a truly global discussion, and that we appreciate the different contexts in which AI impacts people's lives, which varies a great deal, whether you look in, uh, let's say, Bangladesh, another country where elections are taking place, or, uh, or Kenya, or in uh, Turkey, or in the United States, for that matter. And the discussion really is, is very Western-oriented. So uh, Ian and I have worked quite hard with all the members of this UN AI advisory body, which also is working faster than I've seen any initiative at the UN ever uh, kicking off, uh, trying to make sure that this is, is a global perspective. Right. And so uh, that's another thing that I hope will happen in 2024, that this tech policy discussion gets globalized. Okay, Mariska, let me bring in Cliff, because Cliff, Mariska talked very profoundly about AI's impact on democracy around the world. Obviously, there's a 2024 uh, election in the United States, that is the top risk. What is the impact of AI on democracy, on elections particularly, as Mariska alluded to? Well, broadly speaking, it's big. It's, and the potential for disinformation and deep fakes is, is, is mammoth. I mean, the one that I really worry about, which is, uh, I don't think getting the examination deserves, is what are the Russians going to do as we begin to vote in this country, as this election I mean, you know, 2016, I've had Russians privately tell me it doesn't get any better, right? It was like a dream. They, they threw a U.S. election or so people thought they did. This year, you know, they are pretty good at this stuff. Will they go all in on Trump? Will they try to intervene? Well, he's ahead right now. Why would they do that? And maybe tip the apple cart the wrong way. Will they just undermine U.S. democracy in places they're pretty good at? I think the Russians will be active, at least on a baseline level of promoting the erosion that he and I write, write about. They could be much more active in tipping the thing to Trump or trying to tip the thing to Trump. I don't think they know, so I don't think we know, but it's a huge question. Ian, uh, in the report, you talk about five thing, or four things, I guess, that are really impacting the impact of AI. Politics, we talked a bit about that. Inertia, defection, people just opt, companies just doing what they want. And technological speed, things are just moving too quick, the horse bolting from the barn. Um, 
you know, what talk about the the risk versus the opportunity and, and how you gauge this as more risk than opportunity right now? Look, I, I actually see more opportunity than risk in AI. Uh, for I mean, it's it's an incredible technology. It is moving very, very fast. It has very smart people and a lot of money behind it. Um, and it's not just displacing powerful existing actors. It's also making powerful existing actors more powerful so it gets implemented quickly. So there's a lot of upside. This The, the report is not just about saying AI is bad and we need to stop it. But the point is that the people that are focused on the upside, we don't need to worry about them. They're there. No one's going to stop them. They've got the money. They've got the resources. It's the other people that are the ones that need someone to speak for them. So when Marie just says we need to make sure through the United Nations that this isn't just a Western led, you know, sort of a, a, a governance focus or when she says I need, we need to make sure that it's not just the private sector making the rules for themselves, but that publics and governments need to be involved. That's where the risk is. And right. although there is a lot of urgency uh, among policymakers and leaders in the United States, in the EU, in China and in the UN specifically, a few other pockets too. The fact is that as of right now, the technology is moving faster and the private sector is moving faster than the governments. That doesn't make me hopeless, but it does make me feel that the purpose of the governance that is being presently set up will be to create the actors and the institutions and create a roadmap and direction and, and ability so that when the inevitable crises occur, and they will occur, they'll occur faster than they can be prevented, that you will have some ability of the governments to work with the private sector to respond effectively. That the crises can be contained as opposed to will cause the kind of damage that governments will not be able to respond and the private sector will dominate the outcome. That, that's really what's at stake here. And I think since we're, again, we're looking at 2024, which is an artificial time constraint, but we do it every year. We look at 12 months. For the purposes of the coming 12 months, the technology is gonna be moving faster than the governance. And that, that, and that is right. in terms of disinformation and proliferation in the hands of potentially disruptive and dangerous actors, that's where the risk from AI comes about. Okay, so just as we put a pin in this discussion on this, Mariska, last word to you, what inflection point in terms of risks are you looking for in 2024? What should people put on their radar screens? Well, I've talked a lot about governance, but the elections are, are obviously an inflection point, but I would caution a little bit against um, predicting that AI will be the defining factor in determining the outcomes. Another risk is really that people read too much into the impact of AI and that they stop believing the media or the democratic institutions because they believe that they can be upended by this new technology or that we cannot believe anything we see with our own eyes. So it is critical that we also scope the risk of AI to elections in a adequate way. And I feel like there's also a lot of hype and hysteria as there is around AI in general, around this question about what the impact might be on democracy. So let's also try to stay level-headed despite the big risks that are uh, facing us. Uh, I love that. You gotta stay level-headed. Okay, that's Marisha Shake. Thanks so much, Marisha, for joining us. And you can uh, catch Marisha uh, on G Zero's AI video series regularly where she is level-headed, very insightful. And, and you can subscribe to our uh, uh, G Zero newsletter. We have a special newsletter called G Zero AI that drills down into this. All right. So once again, let me just do a quick reset here. This is G Zero's live presentation of the top risks of 2024. This is the annual list from Eurasia Group, our parent company, penned by Ian Bremmer and Cliff Cupchin, who are joining us right now. They're still going to join us. And now we are getting to the top risk of the year. The United States is maybe at the most divided it's been in 150 years. The nation is cannonballing towards what is going to be a very contentious uh, election, at very best, a total disaster at worst. And of course, this has implications uh, around the world. So let's bring in someone who's watched this very closely, Susan Glasser. She is a staff writer at The New Yorker. She's the co-author of The Divider, Trump in the White House 2017 and 2021. She's also written about Russia, so she's uh, well-versed in all these top risks. Susan, first of all, wonderful to have you joining us. Uh, you spent your career 
focused on politics and politicians in Washington and around the world. The top risk this year at Eurasia Group is the U.S. election. We talked about the divided states of America last year, uh, but now it's almost as if American democracy is at stake. And I don't want, I want to be level-headed, as Marichka said, but what is your sense of the size and scope of the risk this year in the U.S.? Yeah, thank you. Well, look, nobody's going to disagree uh, with uh, putting that as number one on the list this year. That's just the nature of it. Uh, the stakes are simply such that, you know, the whole world has a stake in the outcome of this U.S. election, but of course, only Americans can vote in it. And, you know, in the end, what what's really, I think, rightly pointed out uh, by Ian and Cliff is that it's going to be very likely very, very close. And so it's not really uh, a question of what even millions of Americans, never mind the, the global interest in this U.S. election, but our competitive playing field has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And this is something that your international audience may not fully appreciate is that, uh, you know, when I was a kid, maybe half of the U.S. states were truly competitive. You know, it was in that sense much more of a national popular vote referendum, an, a, a U.S. presidential election. 24 states in 1976 were toss-ups uh, in the presidential race. This year, we're looking at, at most, perhaps five or six states that will once again decide the outcome of this election. It's a small number of American voters uh, at a time when there's enormous incentives to push both Democrats and Republicans to their party's respective extremes. This does not bode well when it comes to issues of global governance and America acting as a responsible uh, uh, power. Susan, you've written about Donald Trump. And, you know, again, the likelihood is that he will become the Republican nominee. Uh, it would be highly unusual at this point if he did. Uh, so let's assume for for, for the state, sake of this conversation, he does. What is, is he a genuine risk both domestically and to the wider world? Or is that a kind of partisan, hyperpolarized time and people are overblowing that? What's your sense of calibrating that risk both domestically and internationally? Look, I think it's important to be uh, as realistic as possible in an assessment of uh, the nature of the threat that Donald Trump poses to uh, American democracy, and in particular for this conversation, to upending America's uh, longstanding foreign policy and national security commitments. The answer is, uh, based on the more than 300 interviews that we conducted uh, about Trump, many of them focused on national security in his first term in office, that his second term would be very, very different. Uh, first of all, of course, you have Trump's own words, and you should take them both uh, literally and seriously, as the, right. the sort of truism goes. Uh, when Donald Trump says that he's going to have a second term focused on revenge and retribution, and that he's willing even to entertain termination of the Constitution if that's what's required to put himself back in office, I think it's something not to be discounted. And I know it's hard because of the, the flood of words and threats that emanate from uh, the former president, but I think it's very important, number one. Uh, so take him at his word. Number two, uh, the constraining factor that really, I think, in particular on national security and foreign policy matters hemmed in Trump was personnel. Uh, you know, there's the old Soviet saying, the cadres decide everything. Well, that is really true, especially with Donald Trump, who knows very little, uh, you know, at depth uh, about most of the issues faced by the government and is very focused uh, on a small handful of issues, but is very, therefore, malleable to the agendas of those and execution of those around him. In the first term, he picked people he didn't know who turned out to be much more stewards of the establishment than he wanted. That will not be his mistake uh, as he sees it in the second term. And uh, I think you're looking at something pretty radical. There was, um, I'll, I'll leave you with this, but uh, as we were finishing up our book on Trump's first term in office, we met with a very senior former national security official who'd spent a lot of time personally in the Oval Office with Trump. And I asked that same question that you're asking. And this person said, listen, you know, Donald Trump is like the velociraptor in the first Jurassic Park film. And when the children run into the kitchen and they think they're safe and they shut the door uh, and they're hiding under the tables and then click 
the door turns. The velociraptors have learned to open the door. And, you know, let me tell you, that is a pretty scary moment when a very senior U.S. Uh, national security official tells you that that's what's going to be happening in a Trump second term. Take it seriously. OK, I mean, we've gone from the year of Voldemort, Ian. Now we've got velociraptors here. This is this is uh, turning into not just a, a top risk report, but a pilot for a Marvel thing. Uh, Ian, you write in the report with Cliff, Trump will use his uh, online pulpit, control the Republican Party and friendly media to delegitimize both the system that is prosecuting him and the integrity of the election. Again, to calibrate the risk posed not just in the election, but specifically now, you know, as we move towards the Republican nominee in the next couple of months, Donald Trump. It's funny, you know, the velociraptor analogy, because, of course, opponents of Trump have talked about how small his hands are. And so now apparently, you know, that's like his main his main defining feature is he's like, you know, got the ability to, to grip and turn. And, you know, we should remember that um, although Trump uh, has authoritarian impulses that are well beyond that of any sitting president um, and also has a level of personal corruption uh, well beyond that of any sitting president, that the defining uh, negative uh, attribute that he had as president was incompetence. And that doesn't suddenly go away in 2025. It's not like he's suddenly going to become maximally competent or focus on policy or be single minded in his ability to get the job done. He's still going to want to go out there and talk about himself and read the media and watch television and all that and tweet all the time. So that does contain the damage that can be done. But that comes at a time when the global environment is far more dangerous with a couple of major wars that are going on. And when he was president the first time around, it was quite peaceful. In fact, that is being sold as an attribute of why you should vote for him is because Biden, two wars, Trump, no wars. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think that's the causality, but still from a campaigning perspective, it has resonance and it's a problem uh, for Biden. Um, and, and then also the fact that uh, Trump has a lot more at stake personally. He loses, he probably goes to jail. Um, he wins and he is super vindictive. And so to the extent that he is going to prioritize anything, it is going after his enemies. Well, first of all, it's, it's ending the legal jeopardy that he faces. So he must do a job on politicizing the Department of Justice, the FBI, the IRS, and having them loyal to him, and then going after those that were prepared to jail him. I mean, those are his true enemies. And, and the people that I know that are close to Biden do believe that they and their families will face personal jeopardy mm. if Trump wins. Uh, that, that is not a, a, an exaggeration. Um, and how much they feel, it depends on who they are, with their personality, how senior they are, all that kind of thing. But I mean, the idea that there will be a level of McCarthyism that comes to the United States and that that will have a chilling effect on those that might be independently minded and inclined in the way they engage politically. I think that matters a lot. Um, another point I will raise is that, as you know, these, these risks focus on the year ahead. So we're not talking about Trump being president. That's January 2025, if he wins. But even this year, when Trump gets the nomination, as Susan and, and I presume he will, though it is not guaranteed, um, he will be immediately much more powerful. He he will have the loyal support of almost the entire GOP. Um, and he'll have the money. And he'll have the media attention and all the rest. And that means that suddenly his policy pronouncements on Ukraine and ending support for Zelensky right. and on China and on decoupling and on tariffs and on Iran and going after them as opposed to Biden's weakness. And it never would have happened under Trump because he was the guy that assassinated Qasem Soleimani. Uh, suddenly, the risk environment, once he gets the nomination, becomes much higher. So this is a real and present danger for 2024. And people that are just, they're going, that think that you can be complacent until the elections occur and Maybe you'll maybe you'll skate this one again. Uh, that that is not what we're looking at presently. Okay, uh, Susan and, and Ian, let me bring in Cliff. Cliff, in the report, it said you know the U.S. has two folks running Biden if Trump wins, as, as we've talked about, 
who would not be fit for office. So let me just quickly focus on the risks of Biden. I, I've characterized this election as age versus rage, the rage of Trump, the age uh, of uh, Joe Biden. But in the top risks, the economy is a factor here. Um, has the U.S., I mean, is that cutting against Biden and in terms of a risk? Is it a soft landing cutting for him? On that side, what are the risks uh, in this election, in the U.S. election? So we're a little under consensus as far as, as the U.S. economy goes. We, we think that we're still going to see subpar growth here. But I guess I, mean, I don't really think it matters. I'm a really brief story. I mean, I, I go home to sort of central Wisconsin every year. I was just there about two months ago, went fishing, talked to a whole bunch of people. And, and you know, they're hurting. They don't care if it's getting less bad. What they care about is prices are just going up and they got to pay more for eggs. And I think Wisconsin is one of the states that Susan was talking about. I mean, it's put the last two presidents over the top. So, so I think that people are, it's going to be very hard, even if the economy does improve, it is improving for Biden to get credit for it. I think it's kind of a loser for him right now, the way, the way middle America feels. Susan, let, let me come back to you. Um, we, we're talking about the domestic side. Let's just talk about it in the context of the United States, um, on the international uh, stage, uh, if Trump becomes the nominee, you've written a report about Trump, but also a lot about Russia and, and of course, uh, Putin. Unpack the risks that the U.S. election poses globally in terms of alliances and geopolitically. Yeah, I do. First of all, I, I think Ian's right to underscore that, in effect, the election and its, that its spillover into the international world begins now uh, and not uh, in January 20th of next year. I think that's a very important point to underscore. What I would say as far as the uh, mitigating risk of Donald Trump's incompetence, don't bank on it. Uh, it's recklessness that I think you should be focused on combined with uh, uh, the enabling of a much more radicalized Republican Party. Uh, you know, think of this as, you know, if it if Ian's critique here is that it's the gang that couldn't shoot straight, fair enough, uh, in, in the first term. But remember this, that it's also a gang that has, in effect, been blooded by what happened in the aftermath of 2020. This is not your father's Republican Party. This is, uh, it's not, there's not an equivalence between, uh, well, gee, both sides uh, present uh, the other as a threat. Therefore, we'll just look at it in those terms. And it's not a partisan thing to say that Donald Trump, not just the man, but the movement uh, has brought with him a, a challenge for the first time in American history to the legitimacy of a legal uh, and fair presidential election. And having done that, having continued to follow Donald Trump, were he to get the nomination again, as seems overwhelmingly possible, you are already in a situation where three years after January 6th, millions of Americans, in fact, uh, more Republicans right. today, believe that Joe Biden is not the legitimate president of the United States than at the time of January 6th, three years ago. So this isn't just on the one hand, Democrats will be upset if Trump wins. On the other hand, uh, Republicans will attack the legitimacy of our core institution. So I, I wanna point out that this threat is ongoing. It is a crisis that has already occurred and it is not one that is waiting for the outcome of the election to occur. It has already occurred, number one. What does that mean in a practical sense? Look. Vladimir Putin has every incentive in the world to continue this conflict. He has his own uh, quote unquote election in March of this year. So you may see some stepped up activity in the first quarter of 2024 that is aimed towards whatever uh, messaging Putin wants to the Russian people internally. Uh, that's important to note in terms of the schedule. But the more important uh, date on the calendar for Donald Trump, assuming that, uh, sorry, for Putin, assuming that Trump wins the nomination is November of this year. And I do think that uh, that's got to be what Europeans look at as they think about their security policy, as well as 
a kind of a shaping, almost existential factor uh, for Americans. What kind of American foreign policy can you talk about in a world dividing, unfortunately, once again, between autocracies and democracies if America's own democracy is compromised by a leader of one of our two parties? Again, this doesn't wait for the presidential election. We already have a de facto leader of the Republican Party in the United States who essentially is not committed to democracy mm -hmm. unless he himself wins the election. That that's not the actual definition of democracy. I, I agree <laughs> strongly with Susan here. And I just want to add a, a framing point because I do believe and we do believe that Biden at 81 is too old to run. And if Trump uh, were not running for election, uh, Biden would be seen as unfit to stand for election simply on the basis of that. 86, nobody believes he's actually gonna make it to the end of a second term. That's a problem. That is not an equivalent problem to Trump. Let, let us, and, and, and the issue here is that in any democracy, if you have a former president that did everything in his power to subvert a free and fair transfer of power, that and that person is running again, that should be the number one issue of the election, right. bar none, nothing else is close because that is an existential risk to the nature of your democratic system. Now, the risk in the United States is not that Trump is running. The risk is, tr is that Trump is running and that the risk I just mentioned is not considered the top risk at all by the United States. Uh, it, it's actually that, no, we're both sizing it and you know there are other issues out hmm. there and we're in different information spaces and what about hunter biden and you know what about the economy and what about migration and if the election were held today right now trump would win trump would win the risk is not trump the risk is the degradation of the u.s political systems information space and the dysfunction of american democracy that allows an outcome that is not a free and fair transition of power. That That is where we are in 2024. I got 10 seconds, Susan, just, just on that. And I just can't let you go. Is this, in your view, the riskiest, most threatening U.S. election to the U.S. sort of democratic experiment in your lifetime? You know, every election, uh, uh, every generation has to renew it its commitment to democracy or it doesn't exist. And I think if there's one thing we've learned over the eight years nearly that Donald Trump has taken over and dominated our political scene, it's that uh, the threat is real, it's not abstract, and it's not something that you read about in history books. Okay, I got to leave it there. Uh, well said, Susan Glasser. First of all, a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. We are almost out of time here. We've got a couple minutes left. I'm going to just close with Ian and Cliff. Um, just last word here, um, Ian, I'm going to start with you and then and then Cliff, with you as we um, look at these risks and, and just the last word as people, you know, I know it's mid afternoon here on the East Coast um, when we're uh, doing this program. So maybe too early to have a drink. But after all those risks, I think some people might be hitting the bar, Ian. But what is what is kind of your 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 message to folks looking at the top risk report and what's ahead in 2024? Uh the message is that uh, it's only when you're really challenged uh, that you show uh, your level of courage, your resilience, uh, and your leadership. We're in a world right now that lacks leadership that we believe in. And some leaders will appear in this environment that will surprise us. People that um, decide uh, to step above their station and the lowest common denominator, uh, getting along to get along, uh, because the moment demands it in history. I think we'll be surprised by human beings that step up to do that in existing leadership positions, and also people that aren't existing leaders, but that develop power uh, because they have messages that are authentic and inspire. Uh, that That's what 2024 uh, requires, it demands, and, and historically we've shown ourselves capable of it, both in the United States and around the world. But, but this is a crisis environment, 2024, is a U.S. crisis right. environment, and it's a global crisis environment. And anyone that pretends that that is not true will ultimately get hurt. Uh, that That is, this is not, not a time where you can have a look at this, uh, think it through, and go back to your previously scheduled programming. 
this is a time when you need to actually not just use this information to address your business concerns, your job, your financial markets. No, uh, you also need to be talking to the people that you care about. You need to be connecting with them um, and, and you need uh, to help them not go crazy in this environment, not go down the rabbit hole, but act as citizens. Uh, because uh, again, this this moment demands it. I got about uh, ten seconds here, Cliff. Uh, um, last word to you, just picking up on that, what you're looking for ahead in this very risky year ahead. We're in a system where there's going to be more wars. We're seeing two or three of them right now. I think one of the things the analytic community's got to do a better job of is figuring out what's going on and then predicting where the next war is going to be. And that's something that I hope we'll do a better job at. And everybody will do a better job at in 2024. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our special Top Risks edition of the G Zero podcast. That was interesting and slightly depressing, although I think we ended on a note of optimism there. If you want some more sharp and always objective, nonpartisan geopolitical analysis, and boy, do we need that, take a moment to sign up on the G Zero newsletters. There's eight of them at g0media.com. They are free, they are daily, they cover everything from AI to Canada, US, and of course, geopolitics. And of course, you get the Wednesday edition written by Ian Bremmer himself. As many people say, this is like an intelligence briefing in your email every day. Remember, you can also catch Ian on G Zero World and on the G Zero World podcast every week. The show is on your local PBS station, so check that out. All right, thanks for listening. I'm Evan Solomon, the publisher of G Zero Media, and we'll talk again soon. This G Zero podcast is brought to you by Bleecker Street and LD Entertainment, presenting ISS. When war breaks out on Earth between the US and Russia, astronauts aboard the International Space Station fight each other for control. This sci fi thriller is only in theaters January 19th. You're listening to the G Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.